Good afternoon and welcome. My name is William Chilligator. I'm the music director and conductor of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. And today I'm coming to you from the Cottonwood Room of the Laramie County Library. We appreciate the support of the Laramie County Library, who's been a wonderful partner with the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra for many years. Normally, of course, we'd be in person in this room, and I would have a chance to visit with you about the program and let you get to know our soloists. Well, we're going to do that in the comfort of your home. You get to watch it. And this weekend, we have a fantastic program for you. We have the Helios Trio, which is a trio of piano, violin, and cello. And they're based at the University of Wyoming. And uh, we're very excited to feature them in Beethoven's Triple Concerto. We'll be hearing from them and seeing them hearing them perform right here in the lecture just in a little bit. But you know how I like to save the guest artists for last. So I'm going to quickly talk about the rest of the program before we get to the Helios Trio and the Beethoven Triple Concerto. The Beethoven is actually the first piece on the program. It's a quite substantial piece at around 35 minutes in length. And then after that, we have a, a piece that you've likely never heard, Mary Watkins' Soul of Remembrance. Then after that, Barber's Adagio for Strings, well known and loved. And then after that, Ravel's five movements of his Mother Goose, the Mother Goose Suite for orchestra. I'll talk a little bit about the Mother Goose Suite first, actually. Um, Ravel was a lifelong bachelor, but he loved children. It said that he had a special fondness for children and animals. Well, two of his uh, children friends were the children of uh, dear friends of his, the Godevskis in France. Uh, it was a Polish couple who had these wonderful little children. And Ravel would tell them stories and then games and uh, special little puzzles for them. He really enjoyed the company of those those children. He would send them postcards from his travels around the world. And he gave them the ultimate gift one day in 1910 when he wrote five pieces for them to play at the piano for him, the children to play. It was a little bit beyond their piano abilities, though, and those children didn't end up performing it, but two other children ended up performing it in Paris in 1910 in front of a very distinguished audience, and the piece was quite a sensational hit. Ravel decided that he would expand those five little piano pieces and create a ballet. As we know, in Paris in 1910, ballet was the rage. I mean, this was right around the same time as Stravinsky's Firebird with the Ballet Russe in Paris. And so he created a ballet score with the Mother Goose and the five pieces, and he expanded it, including other pieces. The pieces that you'll hear that the Cheyenne Symphony will perform Saturday night are the original five, but taken from the orchestral version that we have for the suite. And that's how it's often performed these days. The five movements uh, have wonderful descriptive titles, and actually only two or three of them are from the original Mother Goose collection. Some of them are from other children's story collections by famous French authors. It begins with a pavan for its sleeping beauty, and you can't imagine a dreamier, more beautiful and peaceful um, kind of simplicity than this piece. In fact, Ravel said that in trying to awaken the poetry of children's stories, he had to especially thin out his um, orchestral textures and musical textures and try to just get to the simplicity and innocence of the music. Here's a little example of the Pavan for Sleeping Beauty. I'm not sure if you can hear that. One thing that is also interesting about these five movements of the Ravel is that they're all very short. Um, the first movement lasts just about a minute. Um, in fact, you've already heard about half of it. Um, and you can hear that it's lovely and peaceful and there's quite a gentle plucking in the strings pizzicato and harp that kind of make it sound like gentle footsteps of like a young princess, very much like Ravel's Pavan for a dead princess. Um, in this one, though, the story is that Sleeping Beauty is laid to sleep 
And at the end of this movement, the first violin is finally played in the most delicate and incredible, soft and dreamy sound. And you can sense that she's finally gone fully to sleep. And then the idea is that the other movements of the suite and the later parts of the ballet are all dreams that she has. It's a wonderful idea because there's going to be a sort of a bookend at the end when she awakens in the last movement. The second movement is the story of Tom Thumb, whom you might remember is the one who laid out breadcrumbs as he wandered in the woods to try to find his way home. And he was, you know, impossible and lost because the birds ate breadcrumbs. So in this movement, you can hear wandering, meandering strings at the beginning, and a sort of sad sounding tom thumb in the oboe in English horn over it. He's lost in this wandering and searching music. Well, Ravel beautifully depicts the culprits of eating those breadcrumbs as he paints a musical picture of birds that's just wonderful. It happens very briefly, but here's what it sounds like the birds this movement. See if I can find it.
imagination, the introduction of that movement was like they're on their boat journeying, and then once that theme arrived that we just got to, it's like they made landfall in Asia or something like that. That's just my own interpretation. And here we have some orchestral writing, which is again reminiscent of Respighi, with that low clarinet sound and the mysterious harp and celeste. It's wonderful, wonderfully depicted. Um, yeah, and so then the, the next movement of the Mother Goose Suite is the conversations between beauty and the beast. It's a very well-known story. Again, not one of the original Mother Goose stories, but so well-known. And in this um, musical depiction of the conversations, beauty is represented by a solo clarinet. And the beast is represented by the contrabassoon, the very large double bassoon which is quite a beast of an instrument, even just to manage and carry and, and perform. So the two sounds of them are in dialogue. First we hear from the clarinet, then there's an episode of representing the beast with the contrabassoon, and then they perform together. Um, this one is also, I think, reminiscent of Paris around that time, because it seems to me to be very much influenced by Satie's Gymnopédie, which was written just a, a little bit earlier than that, which was quite popular at the time. If many of you know that piece, you might recognize that same kind of casual French lilting waltz like feel. Sounds so much like Juno Pippi. Transformation is happening, and the beast is gone, and the final conversation is between solo cello and piccolo, perhaps representing the prince or beautiful, you know, prince that the beast became, and beauty. Right here, here they're together. touching like, like little modernistic effects that he uses like what well, we heard in the third one of the use of pentatonic scales, um, use of stacked fourths, chordal harmonies. So it's deceptively modern in, in its own way, even though it's beautiful and tonal otherwise. The last movement is gorgeous. It's called the fairy garden. And um, it's not just a, a beautiful vision of a child's vision of paradise in a beautiful garden, which it is. It's also supposed to be the final, the, the awakening of Sleeping Beauty from the first movement, where she's united with Prince Charming. And you'll hear a duet, a beautiful duet between solo violin and solo viola, where one is the Sleeping Beauty and the other is Prince Charming, and they're united in the fairy garden in a beautiful, wonderful, kind of magical moment of music. This is just one of my most famous, or favorite, I should say, one of my favorite build-ups in all of music. Um, this part leading to the end. I'll just jump to this part that I'm referring to.
glorious and magical, really magical. And to me, it's like that part of Peter Pan where it's saying, I do believe in fairies, I do believe in fairies, I do believe in fairies, and it's growing and growing in its incredibly, incredible beauty and magic. And so there's something wonderfully innocent and, and sort of touching about all of these five pieces of Ravel. It's actually hard to imagine that they were written first for just piano four hands, because in the treatment with the orchestra, with the incredible genius of his orchestration, um, it just sounds like it, it, he must have had this in mind, maybe when he wrote it for pianos. Well, that's the last piece on the program. I'm going to go backwards. Before that, we're going to perform Barber's famous adagio for strings. And I thought it would be wonderful to perform this during the difficult times that we've had um, these past 11 months or so. There's something, you know, wonderfully kind of, oh, it's just so emotional, this piece. And although sometimes it's been treated as our sort of national kind of music of grieving, and, and certainly there are those lives that we've lost, these 11 months that we grieve, there's also some kind of part of it that offers hope and a musical catharsis. Um, I'm not going to play an example of it because if, you know, many of us know this piece. But one of the things that strikes me about it each time I get to conduct it is just how simple the musical building blocks of the piece are. How the theme is introduced in the first violins. And it's, a, it's searching and stepping and striving and moving and it's hesitating and it's, you know, making some gestures to get louder and then coming down again. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like so much of the feelings that we have when we're dealing with, with grief or loss, too. All these different kinds of emotions and feelings. And then even before it's done stating that long statement, the violas come in with another statement of it, sort of in canon. And then finally the first violin is finished, the violas continue, and the first violins come back in, and then the cellos take over, and then the second violins have a moment, and it, it builds and builds and builds into, as we know, one of the most heart-wrenching musical climaxes, almost like a musical scream for strings. There's something so poignant about using just strings in this piece. The way that the instruments blend and combine really makes it seem as though it's one voice speaking in all these different thoughts coming through in one personality. It also helps bring out the incredibly juicy and, and, and beautiful dissonances that are in the piece. Dissonances that are within a total framework, which I find very brave that Barber wrote that in that way when he wrote this piece in the 1930s when so many composers were experimenting with non-tonal or otherwise very avant-garde musical styles. This piece is incredibly honest and um, authentic. It, it's very genuine in its emotions. It's not pretending to be anything else. In fact, one of the things that inspired that simplicity and straightforwardness of the music, of the expression and motion, was the fact that um, Barber set this piece to uh, Arturo Toscanini as uh, a piece for Toscanini to perform. And Toscanini um, was known for not liking music. He, he didn't do a lot of modern contemporary music, but what he did do, he wanted things that were not artificial and not just you know effects for effects sake. He wanted music that was straightforward. This is the second movement of a three-movement string quartet that then he transcribed for string orchestra and created this piece that then was premiered by Toscanini in the 1930s. There's actually a recording of that first performance. Actually, an interesting little bit of the history of this piece is that when Barber sent the score to Toscanini, a few days later, Toscanini sent it back without any comment. Barbara was feeling so dejected, like, oh, well, I guess, I, I guess he didn't like it. And then later he learned that it was scheduled for a performance with Toscanini, and he said, why did you send the score back without saying anything? He said, well, I had already memorized it. I wanted to send it back to you as a courtesy. Well, for those of you who don't realize, Toscanini um, had terrible eyesight, and he conducted everything from memory. 
He's responsible single-handedly for um, conductors ever since trying to conduct by memory. Um, and so, but Toscanini himself said, those idiots, those young conductors trying to conduct by memory, if I had eyesight, I would use the music in front of me. Anyway, he quickly memorized the score and conducted a brilliant performance, the first performance. And then, because Toscanini and the NBC Symphony had such an incredible nationwide following with the radio broadcast at that time in the 1930s, Barber, um, in his mid, mid to late 20s, became a household name overnight. Barber wrote his first piece of music when he was seven years old. When he was 13, he entered the Curtis Conservatory, um, and he left there at age 21. Then he won the Prix de Rome. And then shortly after that, he won two consecutive Pulitzer Prizes in music, which had never been done before. He wrote the opera Antony and Cleopatra for the opening of the new Metropolitan Opera House in the 1960s. And most of his music is, like this piece, very tonally based, very expressive, um, very honest. And so much of his music is actually for voices. Um, you know, great, great songs, operas, Vanessa and Antony. Cleopatra. So this piece, um, one of the other things that strikes me as amazing is that that musical climax, that screen, if you will, it's a simple major chord in closed harmony. It's like an E major chord, but it's spelled as an F flat major chord. And then it, it makes me think of Tchaikovsky in his Pathetic Symphony, where he takes a major chord and makes it sound so tragic. I think that's a sign of only the great composers that they could take this kind of chord that is otherwise associated not with darkness and tragedy and sadness, but turn it into that. It's amazing. And then after this incredible silence, after that musical scream, that same chord is repeated quietly in the same progression as it's working through those emotions and calming down. And then the music at the beginning returns but with a very important difference. This time, it's not just the first violins, but the viola is an octave lower. It's as if that through working through these emotions, now there's you're not alone, or something like that. It's like that you're with another who's helping you deal with this and find hope. It's an absolutely gorgeous piece. Um, I feel honored every time to conduct it, and the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra Strings are doing an incredible job. Before that, we're going to perform Mary Watkins' Soul of Remembrance. Mary Watkins is probably not a name familiar to many of you, but she should be. She is an incredible composer who is based in California now, but she did grow up in the Denver area. She graduated from Howard University in 1972. She has had a career both in the classical world and in the jazz world. And in that classical world, she has written theater pieces, operas, um, operas have to do with social justice. In the jazz world, she has written a jazz version of The Nutcracker, perhaps inspired by uh, Ellington's, I don't know, but it's called something like the Jazzy Nutcracker Suite. I might be getting the name wrong, but I have to look into that because I, when I saw the name, I thought, oh, this is a, sounds amazing. But Mary Watkins in the 1990s was asked to write a symphony, um, and she wrote a symphony called Five Movements in Color and it was supposed to be based on the Afro-American experience. And so um, we're performing the second movement of that symphony. It's often done separately. It's called Soul of Remembrance. And in it, a beautiful, beautiful floating melody soars and sings and searches. It has a quality almost like an African-American spiritual. It has a nostalgic quality about it too. And it's it's, it's floating over a delicate march in the harp and one solo bass. And the composer wrote that in her vision, she said that, let's see, I'm sorry. She said, I saw my own people in their long march to fully express themselves as fully human, referring to African Americans. So this piece really speaks to the enslavement of people, the longing and sorrow, looking back on that time, but also a sense of hope. Here's a little example. 
of the opening of this wonderful heartfelt music. To me, it has a quality almost like the slow movement of New World Symphony by Dvorak, the going home movement. It has that kind of feel to it. Here's a little sample. Search, we had, I don't know what it was, it was over a hundred candidates from all over the world. And of course, Chi <laughs> Chin's uh, rose to the top of that, but we had three candidates that were actually invited to uh, the university to perform, and she played this beautiful recital, piano recital, but then Beth and I had a chance to play. Uh, Mendelssohn D minor trio with all of the candidates who came, and w as soon as we sat down to play with Chichen, we thought, "Oh boy, this is, this is great!" You know, it's so so easy to play together, and she's phenomenal pianist. Uh, and so we started playing together as often as we could. Um, I guess then then we came. Well, we got to think of a name for ourselves, and, and uh, Chichen sort of I think came up with. Uh, Helios, but we, you know it's the, the sun rising, and we were 
embarking on a new sort of journey together, we, we thought, well, why not? That sounds like a good uh, beginning. So that's where the name is. That's crazy. And Chin Chen was telling me also that it was so sunny in Wyoming, maybe brighter than what you were used to, <laughs> yes. where you grew up in Taiwan or where you had studied on the East Coast and right. places like that. So because of the sunniness of Wyoming, that's part of the inspiration. That's right. I like that. <laughs> So that's also by way of saying that there is incredible repertoire for this combination of instruments. This trio, you mentioned one of the great masterpieces, the Mendelssohn D minor trio, but there are so many great, great pieces written for this combination that many of our um, people watching today may not realize that maybe there are a few that you could point to that they should listen to or you know, listen on Spotify or YouTube or something like that, and these great piano trios or piano, violin, and cello. Well, uh, we're performing Beethoven Triple Concerto on this program of Cheyenne Symphony, but there are many uh, pieces for the piano trio uh, alone. Um, there's uh, Opus 1, number 1 is an E-flat uh, piano trio, which we played a while back, and they he continues to write trios throughout his... Uh, we're talking about Beethoven. Uh, uh, Beethoven, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, sorry, I'm losing my mask here. Um, and then they continue all the way through to uh, like the Archduke Trio is a great uh, piece of Opus 96. 96. No, I think 96 is one of the symphonies. Wow, something. Anyway, yeah, it's, 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 it's right. It's right. It's the very end of that sort of heroic period before yeah. the late period. But uh, so those are terrific. Uh, one of Beethoven's teachers, Haydn, wrote many, many dozens of trios, and, and he's often touted with sort of inventing that form as he did with string quartets and symphonies. Uh, then uh, also, I guess, in keeping with the, the Ravel on this program this weekend, the, one of the great pieces for this group is the one and only uh, trio that Ravel wrote for piano, for this group, the violin, child piano. Two or four. But so those are uh, Beethoven Archie Trio, um, the Ravel Trio is wonderful. Uh, I think, um, any other suggestions? Bromsky. Oh, yeah, my gosh. But Brahms, there, there are three fantastic trios by Brahms. Tchaikovsky wrote an epic one, which is sort of an elegy uh, to the, the, the death of the Anton Arinsky, was that? The, yeah, Berwinski died. And that one movement is sometimes extracted, I think, from the Tchaikovsky. Right, but it's a mammoth, mammoth piece. Um, right, Dvorak, many, but uh, the Donkey Trio is one of his favorite. Yes, of course. So the repertoire is enormous. Yeah, it's so very yeah, rich. And you guys have such a great chemistry together. I mean, you're just, their whole collaborative spirit is so wonderful to see. And that's one of the great things about this piece, I think, the Beethoven Triple, don't you think? Uh, tell us a little bit about, about that. You want to talk about it? Trio? I'll, I'll I cast the mic so I'm not taking a whole thing. <laughs> but they're in the same household. They don't have to like that. That's right. This trio was written in 1804. It's interesting among Tchaikovsky's um, composition, I mean, Beethoven's compositions, because um, he didn't write anything for multiple solos except for this piece. Um, so it's a, and in its conception, it was the first piece ever written for this combination. So he wasn't falling back on um, any ideas from uh, the past. He was inventing a whole new kind of um, work from this. Right, even though there were Concerto Rossi from the Baroque era, and they would involve multiple violins or multiple pianos, or whatever it was, this particular combination was not really found. That's Sorry. True. Yeah. And in fact, this is really the only thing he wrote that featured the cello in a concerto setting. He wrote many wonderful concertos for the piano, and an exceptionally wonderful concerto for the violin. Yeah. Um, but this is the only way you'll see the cello in a piece of Beethoven in this format. <laughs> um, he had at his disposal a, a wonderful cellist named Anton Kraft, and uh, he had him in mind uh, as he wrote this work. Anton Kraft was just an amazing virtuoso, and um, <laughs> thanks to Anton Kraft, yeah. this cello part is fiendishly difficult. <laughs> um, he was also the inspiration, as John was saying, for the Haydn D major, okay? Yes, yes. the Haydn's uh, D major cello concerto, which is known as the most difficult cello concerto 
It's um, like walking a tightrope when you're because one reason is it's so hot. He yes. treats the cello not in, as a bass instrument at all, but like soaring up there. No, and as you'll see in, in the, the mm -hmm. excerpts we're going to play for you, the cello is very often in the high range of the violin, and then it scoots back down and plays um, these very figurative um, accompaniment accompanimental things in the bass. Um, and I'll speak to Chi Chin to talk about the piano part. So now do we need to wipe it down? Or are we okay? Sorry. We're trying to be good. Here. It's safe. That's right. It's safe. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, John. Two ten. Well, the piano part compared to Beethoven's solo piano concertos is not as difficult. But the difficulty resides in how the piano can color the string instruments and make them sound even more beautiful than when they just play by themselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> not you, teacher. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so as I was telling the maestro uh, that I wish the piano was given at least once to play the beautiful melody in the adagio, the, uh, the, uh, the second movement. Um, but the piano only gets to play this beautiful arpeggio or complemental configuration, which I enjoy because without those beautiful arpeggios, I think the atmosphere will be so transcendent. Um, there are some quite uh, a little bit difficult technically passages in the outer movements. And for the pianist, I really enjoy the, the character in the third movement. And then um, I was very fascinated by how Beethoven traced the material, the same material from cello, violin to piano to explore the different character personality of the same thematic material. And then each of our instruments are able, is able to bring out a different color and sound. So I think if you listen to the concert, then you will be fascinated by how these thematic materials can sustain multiple interpretations and then the instrumental colors. Wonderful. You know, Chi Chen, one of the things I really love about your interpretation of this piece is the incredible musicality that you bring to even those accompaniment filigrees in the second movement. It's so so delicate and so tasteful and as a sign of a wonderful, wonderful musical you know, musician that you can take something relatively simple and turn it into just gorgeous music. A few stretches here and there, just exactly, you know, the, the pedaling and everything is just great. It is true that it's said that because the part is maybe not as challenging as some of his piano concertos, and not maybe even as demanding as the violin and cello part of this piece, that maybe people were conjecturing that it was written for the young Archduke Rudolf, the son of the emperor, who had just started taking piano lessons and composition lessons with Beethoven, and who would end up being his lifelong friend and patron for like 20 years. But I think Archduke Rudolf was about 16 years old when this piece was performed. But he, the records show that he maybe didn't do the first performance, and he didn't dedicate this piece to him as he de Beethoven dedicated so many, including the, the trio that was just mentioned. But, um, so I wondered, what do you think? Do you think that it was maybe written for the Archduke? Um. Maybe, but I, I think because um, Beethoven had so many piano solo concertos written already, and then he really wants to feature this wonderful instrument. And then the way to really enhance the color, the sound of the instrument, he uses uh, a piano and a violin to color yes. it. Just like when he wrote his uh, dual sonatas, a lot of time he had the material traded between the instruments and I have one support or a color the other. Yes. And then just to enhance the material. Right. So right. yeah, so even though it's not so technically challenging, I still enjoy so much because Definitely. yeah, because of all the combination. And you mentioned something which maybe we'll I'll go back to Beth about because it does seem as though the cello is the one who gets to introduce the themes first. And perhaps has a bigger spotlight even than the violin. What's, and is it because of, perhaps it was the novelty that he hadn't written a violin, a cello concerto like he had piano and violin? What do you think? Or he was specifically inspired by Anton Kraft, perhaps? 
Um, but you definitely have a really big role in this piece. I don't know the answer. Uh, I have to do a seance or something. Yeah, <laughs> get in touch with the Beethoven. Here's my personal theory about why he wrote this piece. He was also obsessed with threes at the time. I'm guessing that he started this in 1803, when he was 33, when he was in the middle of writing his third symphony, which is in the key of E flat with three flats, and which is very unusually for the time has three French horns. And maybe he was obsessed with threes. That's just a little side. <laughs> it's my own little theory. <laughs> Do you want to, sorry, go ahead. Well, we could go ahead and play. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. Do you want to give us a little sample? Yes, and I'll, I'll give John the microphone so we can tell you what we're going to do. I sure what we're going to do. What we did the other day. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, a, a large portion of the first movement of the piece, which is a big, uh, for those of you out there understand, form, uh, Sonata Allegro form, typical of, of the time. But it introduces all the themes, and you get to hear the, the themes passed around a bit. Uh, and then we did the, uh, we did the, slow movement the end of the, we'll do the end of the, lar the Largo, the slow movement of this piece is interesting because it's not really a, a typical slow movement that like you might, as you might have in a symphony or a concerto, it's a, it's very beautiful, but it's kind of a long introduction that goes into the last movement which is uh, a, a polonaise, uh, a la polaca, which is interesting to take a sort of nationalist dance. Polish uh, dance, yes. for, for, Like a folk dance, a Polish dance for the last movement. And oh, I just, uh, maybe we could do a little portion of this, I don't know that we did the other day, but there's a really fun section in the last movement that goes into A minor, and I was reading just the other day, uh, there's a, there was a famous French violinist, one of the founders of the so-called Franco-Belgian school of violin playing, by the name of Charles de Berriot. And he wrote a piece that was really popular around the same time as this piece called Scène de Ballet. And the final uh, movement of that sort of, or the final section of that kind of through composed piece is called Tempo de Bolero. Oh. And it has the same sort of foot stomping thing as this A minor just sort of reminded me. I, we don't know that Beethoven actually heard that piece, but it's from around the same time. So maybe we think of that when we get to it. Yes. So we'll do a, a, a portion of the first movement, we'll jump to the end of the second, and we'll go into the third, and we can stop and skip and play a little bit of the bolero or polonaise, whatever. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll get to the playing. I'll hand this mic off. Thank you.
Fast forward.
There's some sort of yes. special quality to this combination. Sunny. Yes, it has a sunny quality too. And there's also kind of a friends and family kind of quality to this. <laughs> Oftentimes the performers are either married, as they are in our cases, or like fathers and daughters or mothers and sons. I've seen it done in many ways like that. And there's a, a sort of togetherness about this and a sort of musical companionship, which I think is so perfect because I was thinking that in many ways this concert um, has so much is about coming back together and you know being united and, and sort of a celebration of togetherness when we're so socially distanced right now and divided perhaps as a country. And so I think there's just this wonderful sort of musical togetherness embodied in this piece. And you guys really bring out that spirit. Gosh, it was fantastic. Well, it's a lot of fun and it's been a real pleasure this whole week working with Cheyenne Symphony. Oh, gosh. Yes. Our pleasure, yes. I love the different kinds of special qualities you're bringing to it. In the last one, there's this one section where you take this, these liberties that I had never heard before, and it just makes so much sense. The thought. That the, oh, right. And, and, it, and well, that was the, then the first movement, too, where it's wandering. And I love that quality about it, that you're bringing out these new things I've never even heard before. So, um, we didn't get into a lot of your background, but we're kind of out of time a little bit. Um, I just want to thank you so much for everything you're bringing to this performance. Um, incredible musicianship. You're doing such a fantastic job with this. And we're so lucky that we also get to have you playing in the orchestra. Uh, even Chi Chen will be playing Celeste in the Ravel as well. Thank you. Um, but we're so grateful that you're our friends and colleagues from just over in Laramie, and I look right. forward to working with you many times. So, thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all for tuning in to this uh, Classic Conversations Lunch and Learn with Cheyenne Symphony, right here at the Commonwood Room at the Laramie County Library. Now I'd like to li introduce Elizabeth Thornton. Is it Thornton? Thorsten. Thorsten, I'm sorry. <laughs> she will tell you about a few upcoming events at the library. Yes, thank you for joining us today. This was a wonderful experience. I'm so glad that social distancing didn't put a kibosh on this. The next performance of the symphony will be tomorrow. There are still tickets available at CheyenneSymphony.org. Go get your tickets for an in-person or live stream uh, attendance. Our next event for Classic Conversations Lunch and Learn will be Friday, February 26th at noon. 
The link to register through the library will be available on our website within a couple of days. And then the, pro excuse me, the uh, concert will be Saturday, February 27th. It's called Capricious Classics. And that sounds like it will be a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us today. And please check out both the Symphony's website and the library's website for more events to come. Thank you. Thank you.